Well, welcome, friends. Randy Sala, Assistant Professor of Business on the Northeast Campus, and welcome to the second unit of Marketing 1311, the target market. Now, friends, this is, in my opinion, what the essence of marketing is all about. Yes, advertising is very important. Sales, extraordinarily important. Social media, where we get our product, the place, the pricing of it. But we have to make sure we know who our customer is. So this is why marketing is so important. It's the target market. Who are we targeting? What customer are we going after? Who is your audience in the theater? All theater productions are based upon and plays written for a certain target audience. So this is our second unit, behavior, targeting, and segmentation. So let's look at buyer's behavior, and this will give us an indication. Again, we're peeling back layers to find out who our customer is. I've said it before. If you enjoy psychology, if you enjoy sociology, you might like marketing as your major and as a career because we are using the applied sciences of both those disciplines. Why do we buy? What's the motivation behind the purchase? It's very intricate. Why do we buy so much? Hey, this is America, all right? We love to shop. 65% of our economy, of our gross domestic product, of $22 trillion in 2019, that's based on shopping. That's based on us buying. So, very important stuff here. Let's take a look at it. Marketing. We need better definitions. We talked about it. Absolutely any contact your organization has with the public. Best definition, definition of marketing by Jay Conrad Levinson from the Guerrilla Marketing Series. Great books, my friends, to read if you're interested in business. Again, J. Conrad Levinson. The art of managing change. This is what marketing is. We're changing minds. We're going to maintain your mindset. Keep you from changing. It's important. Again, got to switch brands or purchase a new product or service that has never existed before. Let me tell you, that's asking a lot from people. Your new business idea your new product, a company's new product. We can't just throw it out there in the marketplace and expect, hey, well, we know it's better, so everyone is going to simply buy it. <clears throat> that was pardons. So, what is consumer behavior? Again, this is a consumer marketing class. So it's everything in that area. Buying behavior of final consumers. Now, the consumer market is all the individuals and households that buy to acquire goods and services for personal consumption. We are still going to flesh out the better definition of a market. So here we go. A market is a group of individuals that have need for a product. That's important. They have the willingness and ability and authority to purchase that product. Now that is a beautiful Porsche. Um, it's an automobile. It could get you or I to our work. It could get us to school. It could get us a lot of different things. So since Porsche has a product to sell us, I guess everybody is in Porsche's market. Well, I'm going to flush it out again here. Do we need a car? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you need a car. Would you be willing to have a Porsche? Now I know somebody just said, well, I don't know about me. There's expensive cars. Yeah, it's expensive. It's, everything is about it is expensive. Expensive to maintain, to upkeep, but isn't that beautiful? Would you be willing, if I could park a Porsche in your garage, in your driveway this evening, would you take it from me? Of course you would. So, whoa, we have a need and we have the willingness. Is that is that it? Can, can we just say everyone is in our target market? No. Do. Most adults have the ability and authority. Those are two important characteristics. I've got to have the ability, and the ability is the, the, the affordability of it, right? I've, I've got to be able to buy that product, and then I've got to have the authority as well. 
again, who is involved in the process? There's a lot of moving parts here. So to have all those four, yes, we have the need. Yes, we'd be willing. Do we have the ability? And again, if I drove that thing home, I'm sure my wife would say, oh, give me the keys. It's my new car. And then I would just break down and cry. So ugh, what do we got here? Porsche's market focused on what? All right. Working professionals, not just working professionals with at least $150,000 income and, and above to purchase that car. Doesn't mean everybody has to have that. I mean, there may be a college student who goes out and buys one. My, my hat's off to you. Congratulations. And you may not fit that ideal, but that's where we are casting the net. Okay. And again, we may actually get down to probably somebody single or it could be a male in his middle 50s and above who's having some sort of a crisis in his life. We'll get back to that in a minute of who actually buys that car onward. This class, I'm sure, is one of the, has one of the most attractive markets in the United States. 18 to 32 year olds, those of us who are in that age group, we consist of 27% of the population. Now, think about that. Think between 18 and 32. Think where you were a few years ago, especially those of us who were, you know, 18, 19, 20, and, you know, 18, 25. A few years ago, uh, we were still growing, okay? This group is going to experience a tremendous amount of change just physiologically and psychologically uh, in these next few years. So, huge spenders on these consumables, fast food. Hey, fast food isn't the best for us, but it sure tastes good. It sure tastes good. It's relatively inexpensive, and we can get it when we need it because we're always on the move. We're going to work. We're coming from school. Uh, we're going out with friends. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things, and so we need stuff quickly and inexpensively. Entertainment, music, gaming, if you look at the music industry, has always focused on that 18 to 32-year-old market. What are they going to buy? Because they're going to see most movies uh, and, and buy most of the music and, of course, gaming right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, we've got some very young population and they're gaming pretty hardcore and, you know, 12 years old. But, uh, but why? This group has that ability and authority to purchase. And again, when we can get you purchasing at a very young age, it's a good chance you'll purchase the rest of your life somewhat in the same fashion. Clothing, yeah, have to. Hey, we're in school. We're getting our first professional jobs. Uh, and again, we, we, we may be still growing. So, and we want to be, in the, you know, this group definitely wants to be seen. We want to be fashionable. So all sorts of stuff. Electronics. This is interesting. I've done some research on this group. 93% uh, instance in the United States own a computer. Okay. We know there's some areas in the United States who don't have technology access. So 85% internet access. That's about the United States right there. It's 90% on a smartphone. I thought this was very interesting. Only 57% on a car. Now, back in the day, if uh, I can glance backwards just for a moment, in those 1980s, what a decade, uh, you had, car was number one in your life. Because car got you everything. Car got you to your friends. It got you out to eat. It, it, it did so much. But obviously, in your phone, you can pretty much Uber. You can get Lyft. You can get your food delivered to you. You can do shop. Uh, very interesting. We, you know, the, the phone is much more important. Recent history is saying that in the last three or four years, driver's license applications before the age of 21 years old in the United States have been at an all-time low. They, they've been, they've been like the lowest in history. Uh, people just aren't getting cars. Uh, and now, of course, with the era that we live in now, how much have you been driving your car? Uh, so... 95% of all ink, I would say probably over 100% because we just pull out a credit card. Uh, we're, we're, and this group right here spends and they spend everything. Do you see why? Marketers, consumer companies, fast food, everything we just talked about, clothing, love this generation, this, this group right in here, why they're always targeting it. Yeah, you're going to spend a lot. So I pose a question to you. Always did this um, uh, in lecture classes. So here we are. Here's your choice. 
behind door number one is the best technology out there for you. You get your iPhone X Pro, and if you're a Samsung person, you get the best Galaxy out there. You get whatever watch, whatever wearable you want. You get the new iPad, um, excuse me, the new uh, MacBook Pro. You get the latest iPad Pro. You also get an Alienware. Okay, I know some of you want to need a PC and game, so you get you get both of them, and you get the Sony Mark III, uh, seven Mark III camera, which is which is probably the best digital camera slash um, movie uh, theater mode as well. I mean, it shoots great, great movies. So, I mean, I'm an Icon person and Canon. They're all fantastic. So you pick your brand. You get that tech, and you get a yearly upgrade. You do, however, for the next six years, need to drive this. 2004 Honda Element. It's got 205,000 miles on it. The shot, the struts are, you know, a, a little, uh, little dicey, but it runs pretty good. It's a little tank. It's a great utilitarian car. That's door number one. Are you going to keep that for six years? But you do get yearly upgrades, so your tech is always tight. Boom. Number two, you get a 2019 Honda Accord. Okay. Uh, or 2020, you know, you, you get basically one with just 10,000 miles, a showroom car, and you get to keep that for six years. You got to keep it. You don't, 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 don't sell it. You don't get to, you know, drive it off and sell it immediately. You get the cool, the very nice car. This is the tech you get. You get a flip phone. Man, I love those flip phones. They made such the best noise when you closed it. You get a crappy Dell computer. Sorry, Dell lovers. I don't think that's a uh, statement anymore. But you get the old Dell laptop, the Latitude, that's all plastic, and that just basically keeps a circle most of the time because it's always updating. Once in a while, you can use it. You get the Dell Tower, all right, and you get an Acer uh, uh, tablet. That tech you have to keep. You don't get any upgrades. Basically, if it goes bad, we just put a new battery in it. You know, we're, we're, we're going to give it a maintenance account. But you do get the best car. Well, you know, a nice car, very nice car, uh, Honda Accord. Wins all the awards. So, door number one. Raise your hands. Come on, I said raise them. All right, very good. Door number two. It's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, I'm, I, I, would, I would pick door number one. I mean, uh, and again, I've been doing this little survey for, for several years now, but uh, I, I am addicted to technology, as, as, as most of us may be. Uh, I usually get on this one probably 70 to 80 percent, probably 80 percent pick this one. 20 percent will pick the new car because they just love that, and I, and I get it. But it is interesting, interesting how, how we need, I mean, we really do, need our tech. Oh, the inner forces. Let's, let, let, let's get to the psychology, the psyche of normal behavior. Now, again, there, there is some psychotic behavior out there, and, and this class does not touch on, on uh, abnormal behavior. But in, in, in a given normal behavior, we have three inner forces. We're going to take a little bit from Sigmund Freud and some modern-day psychologists as well. And so here we have it. We have the soul, all right? In the soul, the soul seeks to do what is right. This is the moral compass. Martin Luther King said, any time is always the right time. To do the right thing. So this this is the compass that wants to always do the right thing. Okay? Very big force. But there's another force. There's the ego. The ego wants to be right. Even if we're not. We want to look very good. There's, there's a bit of narcissism in here. And again, if you've seen someone like this at work, always has to be right. Yeah, you, you kind of see these people through there, but we have it. We all have, inherently, we have these three forces. So the soul wants to do right. Ego wants to be right, okay? And the body wants to just escape from it all. I just want to feel good. We always want to feel that homostasis uh, in, in our brains. That is, I don't want to be in conflict all the time under normal behavior. I just want to, I just want to feel good. So... Get up in the morning to do our work, eat right. That's the soul saying, hey, I got to keep myself healthy. The ego could take a break and say, I just, yeah, I want to look good. But the body says, well, could I just sleep another 30, 40, 50 minutes and not work out? I just, I just want to escape from that. So my friends, we wake up every morning 
That alarm clock goes off and the battle begins. There they are, the three forces. Who gets it right? Is this important in marketing? Because when you can figure some of these things out, how people, you know, what makes people tick, what motivates them, you can help find your target market. And you can also, you know, possibly uh, appease their motivations, get them to buy something. Oh, yeah, there it is. The Porsche Carrera GT. It's 150 grand, and you're looking at that. Now, which of the three really like that? Ah, I think the ego says, yeah, I got a promotion at work. I would look great in that car. Well, I sure would. And so would you, by the way. Absolutely beautiful. It's powerful, okay? It makes me feel powerful, important. Okay, now the body says, let me get it in here. Hey, these are very comfortable, rich Corinthian leather seats. Now, I feel pretty good here. Now, the soul says, yes, yes, I, I give it to you. It is gorgeous. And no matter how you look at that car, it is just gorgeous. Uh, you take a bird's eye view, you go from behind, you get from underneath it, it is a gorgeous car. But I can't afford that. Are you crazy, Randy? can't do that. It doesn't make sense. It's just not practical. I mean, there's nothing at all practical about that car. Now, salesperson, as you're looking at it, she's gone in and run all your numbers and says, come out and comes back out, Randy, you know, congratulations. I just got your information. You've been approved for financing. And in fact, don't worry about that 150 and the other three zeros behind it. It's going to be a lease. You're going to drive this? Six twenty-five a month. The average car payment in North America is about four fifty to four seventy-five. You're just one hundred and seventy-five dollars more than the average car payment. Is that an average car? It does make better sense. You know what? You can't afford not to have that car. See what we did? We aligned two of those forces together. Okay. We got the ego, which of course you know the ego is going to ram that in a minute. I want that. Got the body liking it. Hey, I feel good. And now he's kind of got to sell the practical side again. All we have to, all the salesperson she has to do is get you to sign, and then you figure things out later. Behavior, my friends, the soul, the ego, the body. I want it now. Says the. That's also the id, super ego, and ego. I want it now. I need to do some planning before I get it. You know, you, you, you can't have it. It's just not right. That's always going through our minds. If you can align at least two of those together, you may have an uh, a, a easier time of convincing someone to buy that product or service. Do you think that the American landscape of major corporations and businesses understand that? And they spend billions of dollars to, to make sure that you decide and help you. Remember my friends, buyer behavior, there's needs and wants, okay? Uh, you know, you got that need is, 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 you know, where you are and where you want to be. The Toyota Corolla, which I owned for many, many years, is a good, practical, great car, has great reliability, has no problem getting you to work, getting you to school, getting you around, wherever you need to go. All right, but what about that want? I need a car. I sure love that red Lexus right there. Okay, this is society shaping, all right, based on those needs, but exposing you to different alternatives. That Lexus is going to impress a lot of people. The Corolla probably gets parked in the back parking lot as far as away as I can. I suffer from low self-esteem, of course. And so, uh, but if I drive that Lexus, it's getting in a front parking space again. The businesses in the United States, that's where we spend so much money getting you to move from one point to the other. The factors. Think about this. Think about the factors that influence your behavior when you buy a certain product. Depends on where you are right now in life. Uh, maybe you're just stepping out and you're, you're going to really step away from the family and start buying and start to get on your own. Uh, we've been out for a while. These these effects are, are strong. Culture, subculture, social class, groups, networks, the family, the roles, the life cycle you're in, the occupation you have, uh, the economic situation that we are in, self-concept, personality, and of course, 
again, when we get into the psychological, there's the motivation, there's that, there's the learning beliefs and attitudes, and there we are, the buyer. These are hitting us every second of the day. So, culture. Culture is, you know, kind of what we grew up with. It's that set of basic values, perceptions, I mean, they're learned. And, and, and much of it is learned from the family, and there's nothing more important, more influential than the family unit in the world, and especially uh, where we have been up, where our upbringing is, how our parents decided, our siblings, okay, religious affiliations that, that, that shapes our culture, where we live, where we've grown up, all of this certainly influencing how we buy our products and services. So, if we look at some subcultures, again, that may be people with shared uh, same uh, experiences. And again, uh, the family, the siblings. Do, do, does, if you are, uh, you know, brother, have brothers or sisters, and where are you in that birth order? If you're the alpha dog, you're the first, you know, your influences have shaped your brothers and sisters. I am the fifth of five children, and I was one of those kids where mom and dad didn't like each other for about 10 years, and then they liked each other again for a short period of time, and then I came along. So I am like 13 to 14 years younger than my oldest sibling, and about seven years than my next sibling, and I'm the fifth of five. So I had a very interesting upbringing because my parents were so much older when I was born. Everyone thought I was their grandchild, and nope, it was just me. So that has a lot to do the extended family that we have, where we live. Is there a difference between Highland Park and Alton City? Now that Highland Park home right there, the average Highland Park home is somewhere around ten to twelve million dollars. Uh, Plano versus South Lake, education, the school, all have tremendous influences. So, if one day we do live in the Highland Park. Uh, what kind of car would I have to drive? Could I, could I get away with my old Corolla or would I be probably followed by a, a law enforcement official? Yeah, uh, you know, at this point I gotta drive a Range Rover, big time Cadillac, Merc, uh, something big because that's just what is shaping the culture of where we are. Interesting, interesting things, my friends. Social class. Yeah. Uh, again, this is divisions of society. This is what we look at in demography. For those of us who study sociology, again, interest, values, similar values, again, based on education, all right, occupation, income, and geography. Huge. Absolutely huge right in there. And again, these are tools how we break up a very large population, okay, about 330 million people in the United States. They all cannot be the same customer. We're going to break it down, break it down, break it down. Close to 10 million between Dallas, Fort Worth, Collin County. So you have a food truck, you have a, a store, a shop, a service. Is everyone your customer? I don't think so. You gotta break it down. And these are some of the tools that we use. The factors, groups, the word of mouth influence, the opinion leader, our networks that we have online, again, the family, the family, the role and status. We've got to keep fleshing it out. The social factors, the group, group behavior. Does the group have any effect on our behavior? For those of you who grew up and, and did uh, organized sports, you know, you want to fit in. Not only on organized sports, they're very strong. Um, there's, there's always a reference they're very powerful in terms of behavior. I mean, what would what would they think if I did this? You know, it's the conformity. Now, the only thing, one of the only things good about maturing in life, and I'm just getting older, uh, is, is this means less and less the more mature we get. It just takes us so long to figure it out. The group has a lot of influences in our behavior, especially what we buy. And of course, we have opinion leaders, all right? These are influencers, the dominant personality of the group. 
All right, they're the first to purchase products. Oprah Winfrey in her, uh, what you would call her uh, prime of her show. If uh, and this was back in the 80s and 90s when they really didn't have a tremendous amount of online influence. But if you got on Oprah and you're an author, and she promoted your book, in next week you'd have no less than eight million purchases in in one week. That is that is that is huge. There's always that person in high school, all right, who's a dominant. You may hate them. That's a very young James Spader. Uh, but there's always somebody like him or her, the mean girl, so to speak, that did influence you. And even as much as you despise them, you still want some sort of acceptance by them, possibly there. Again, experts in their field, if I were to tell you, you know what you need to do. You need to take at least a thousand milligrams of vitamin C every day uh, during this fall semester. Keep, keep, keep yourself strong so you won't get the cold, uh, possibly a flu. Uh, you'd say, all right, what's this dude trying to mansplain me? All right, I don't need to, oh, now your doctor said that. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to take that vitamin C. Yeah. So lots and lots of opinion leaders. And of course, the online social media, you know, it's about 3%, the last uh, uh, statistics I just read, 3% of, uh, of people online are creating the content and 90% are following it. Just gives you an idea how important social media is. Uh, and, and of course, the macro influencers, those who have 500,000 followers uh, and micro influencers, maybe have just a couple of thousand. But the bloggers, YouTubers, Instagrammers, et cetera, et cetera, brands try to partner with them. Uh, give them all the free stuff because they know how important their influence is. If you've had a chance to either get on Hulu or Netflix on the fire catastrophe that happened, it was a fraud. It was basically supposed to be the great uh, beach version of Coachella. And uh, I, I put this up here because it got, it really caught, literal, <laughs> it caught so much uh, um, attention on on the influence social media I can get it out there we are and uh, it, it became it was just a big bust and, and uh, a lot of people lost tons of money and everyone who went to it lost all their money it was like five thousand dollar trip for a weekend you see the little tents back there they were promised beautiful villas that they were going to be staying on and that's those little uh, tents right there that's what they got in it was it was it was a tremendous bust and we were wondering what type of responsibility the social media influencers had because they pumped this up so much and so many people went to it. Again, it's called a fire fraud, a fire with a Y. Uh, check that out. This is very, very interesting how things can catch on fire so quickly, uh, you know, through our word of mouth and social media. Other social factors, again, the family. This is the most important. And love our family not love our family, want to get away as far as we possibly can from them, but can we ever do that? The influence that our family has upon us is tremendous. A few things that have changed. 50% of uh, today, 50% of men do grocery shopping for the family on a regular basis. Now, I think that's interesting. That's someone who grew up with a very traditional family and a uh, very uh, I guess you'd say uh, dogmatic father. I mean, my dad knew where the liquor store was. Yeah, we had that was our that was our Saturday morning, you know, escapades there, of, of filling up the bar for Saturday night parties. But if you asked him to go buy something from a grocery store, he'd have a panic attack. He'd just get lost in the store. And today, uh, you know, uh, I'm certainly representative of that. Uh, men do much more of the daily work. Women, which is a great great study if you're interested in marketing the influence of women in purchasing it's 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 not even tremendous it, it's absolute women outspend men on new tech products did you know that all technology women will always outspend men 66 percent of all new car purchases are decided by women what about children we'll, we'll get a little more into this as we go on children these kids now this is probably our generation z right now young z coming into alphas 43 billion in disposable income. This is kids. I mean, we're talking like 12 and under. What kind of allowances are these kids getting? Well, they're getting a lot of it. And they have tremendous spending influences. So the family, the family, the family. Interesting things. Very strong. The strongest on influences. You know, we, we talk about the market. 
Now, wait a second. Now, that's American Girl. Still pretty popular. It was very popular in the late 90s and early aughts. And, of course, their market, their target customer is a tween girl between 7 and 14 years old. That was the tween. Uh, you know, obviously. We said are these, these what percentage of this of, of this uh, pop, of this market really wants a doll? And these are great stories. They all have, um, you know, they're dolls of heritage. I know I bought three of them, and they're not cheap. All right, they're a hundred dollars a piece. How many seven-year-olds have the ability and the authority to purchase a hundred-dollar doll? Yeah, interesting. Yet this company does a killing in it. Uh, they get mom and dad. If you have young children, if you have young uh, brothers and sisters, especially young girls, you're going to see right now the catalogs that come out for Christmas. They're inundated. My, my, my daughter is in her 20s now, but still we're still on those mailing lists. And this company also knows that these are collectible items, so they've got a pretty good percentage of women well into their 30s, 40s, 50s who buy a lot of the accessories for all the dolls because they, they are heirloom. Interesting, children's influence. If you have a child or you know younger brother or sister, and, and you bring them to the grocery store, bring them to any store, but certainly you know we, we spend so much at the grocery store, you're going to spend twice as much. You will. Yeah, two trillion dollars. That's almost a ten percent spending influence in the United States comes through under twelve years old. Pretty crazy. Social factors, word of mouth, the testimonies. Hey, you know. Well, I want to buy something. I'm, I'm thinking about buying a big, and the bigger the purchase, obviously, the more research we should be doing. So we ask a friend. We ask somebody at work. Hey, how do you like that new car of yours? Okay, uh, do you like the MacBook Pro better? What kind of camera did you just buy? Tell me about it. Uh, online ratings, 60% utilization factor, which means 60% of the time we base it on an online rating. That's why you have so many professional online raters right there. They just go on there and. Uh, for fees that they don't tell you about, they really pump up all the actual ratings on there. Uh, interesting. Yeah, we certainly use that. What about personal factors? Um, do how we age the life cycle, does that have any effect on what we purchase, what we do for a living? Again, our economic situation, the environment we're in, the lifestyles, you know, the personality, the self concept Okay, uh, age life cycles, you know, uh, we do purchase. Think about what you bought 10 years ago. Are you buying the same stuff? More than likely you are not. Okay, and more than likely you will not buy five years from now the same things you're buying today. So as an organization, as a marketing manager, as a business owner, you've got to understand, hey, i got to change with my customer or, or I've got to change to a new customer. If my customer is changing, how do I change with it? All right, 20 to 40s have the same as, as those 50 to 70 year olds. Now that is a Cadillac. Okay, if you look what a Cadillac was marketing towards the, the company themselves in the 1970s and 80s, you bought a Cadillac when you had arrived. Okay, you become a lawyer, a doctor, you hit your business well, you, you get that giant promotion. You kind of bought that Fleetwood that El Dorado, okay, those were the big selling Cadillacs, and they were big, they were boats. I mean, they were, we're talking 30 feet in length. They were huge, but you could see this car coming from a mile away, and that's exactly what the person driving it wanted you to think. And this person probably bought one Cadillac. This was it. This was maybe two if they were a big roller throughout their lives, but, you know, this was the kind of car we're going to have. Now, that was a traditionalist generation. So now we have the baby boom generation, which has been the biggest up to that point coming through, not 75 million strong. And they're buying, are they going to buy that same Fleetwood? Or, no, that's, that, that, that's our, those are old people. We want something young. So Cadillac completely redeveloped their cars through the early 1980s and, and to the late age of the night, to what we have today, to the CTS, the STS, the Escalade. Um, as they knew, and of course they have, you know, Led Zeppelin was basically the uh, tag song for so many years trying to get that baby boom generation. It worked very well for them. Oldsmobile, other cars that didn't, they just died off because their market died off. So, interesting, interesting, interesting. Now, 
the older demographic is, is, is growing. People are living longer and they do have the money, but what are they buying? These are things we have to figure out, my friends. So occupation, all right. That might be very interesting. We used to just base things just on income, okay? So let's say two people, two, two women have a $85,000 income. Will they buy the same? You know, we still have to, as you say, peel back this, the layers here for our target market. So, so one's a social media manager. She makes 85. One's the other. She's a master plumber, pink plumber and sewer. And she makes 85 grand. That's her income a year. Uh, her, you know, but she's make. Are they going to buy the same class? Are they going to have the same car, same social activities? More than likely not. So, again, what you do will dictate what you buy. So many different lifestyle and personal factors here. Again, if you have a job and it's going well, you have the confidence to purchase. We have Christmas coming up and you say, you know what, I'm going to treat my family or I'm going to buy something special. Um, if you have that same job and all of a sudden the, the company uh, says, you know what, uh, we, can't, we can't make it anymore. COVID-19, we're going to have to lay off a lot. Um, we're seeing that tremendously in travel and entertainment, especially the travel industry, uh, major airlines. Uh, and we're talking pilots. We're, we're talking people who have been around a long time. Probably are going to really play it, what you would say, close to the vest. And that just means they're going to be very conservative with their money. They're trying to hoard it right now, keep as much in the bank as possible because we just don't know what that future is going to bring. That has a lot to do with what you're going to purchase, correct? Yeah, the stability in there. Your lifestyles, the work, the hobbies, the activities, what, what you do, okay? If you're very active, you buy active things, okay? If you're not, if, if you're into, uh, you know, again, just tons of electronics, and you're going to buy those. So we look at that with our personality. You know, do you, do you think you buy something as, because it represents who you are? We can tap into those as a marketer, as a business. Then you can really, really, really narrow and define your target market. But it comes first with our behaviors. So let's look for a few things. Let's look for the psychological factors, motivation, perception, learning, beliefs, and attitudes. If you have taken a psychology course or sociology course ever, then you've run across what one of the great um, social constructs of motivation by Abraham Maslow was an industrial psychologist. And again, think of where we've come in as just a society worldwide in the United States where, where we came in from wars, World War, from World War I, then we, we had World War II. And you know we're trying to see you know what motivates people as we're building the, the biggest economies uh, post World War II. You know uh, what 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 basis can we figure out why people work? What makes them do things? And so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's a hierarchy. So you see, it's very pyramidal in shape here, which means we have basic needs. We got to survive. We go up to safety. We want some social things, esteem, and self actualization. So we're going to look at that, but since this is a marketing course, it's a great book out there. It's an old book. It's written in the 50s by a man named Vance Packard, and it was called The Hidden Persuaders, also called Packard's Compelling Needs. Now, he was a writer for advertising. He was an English person. He's not a psychologist. Never, never uh, you know, said he was. But, you know, he basically came with what he called his hidden persuaders and said, I, I've been in advertising for a while and I think I know what people, what people ticks, you know, and again, this is why they will buy a product. If you can, if you can persuade someone that your product or service does this for them, you have a very good chance of them purchasing it. And it closely follows Maslow's need, why people purchase. So let's see if we can kind of meld these two together and get a very interesting understanding of our motivational sequence. Now, the first sequence of Maslow is physiological. I have to have food. I have to have shelter. I have to have clothing. All right? I basically have to live to fight another day. Okay? So there it is, the very bottom. Uh, anytime we don't feel good about ourselves, just remember so much of the world's population today, for the longest time, about 75% just live in Maslow's hierarchy of needs number one. Just the physiological. So... If we have that, is that all we want? 
Once our physiological needs have been satisfied, do we want something more? Absolutely. Then they go into psychological needs. Well, we want to be safe, correct? Yeah. So we've got the first set of needs. On more, we, would you like stability in a career? You don't want to be a what's called a day laborer and have to find work every single day doing anything. We want, hey, I, lo I love this stability in a career, a set work schedule, some money in the bank, a steady paycheck. And my friends, those of you, when we become managers and, and, and leaders in different departments, and uh, what really makes people upset, employees upset, is when their schedule is consistently changing. In fact, it gives the most stress in the workplace. Uh, and so if you have an ability to control that and to help someone else, that is when employees, I mean, is one of the first things they look for. I want to make sure I can be, uh, I'm here at 8, I'm here and leave at 5. I'm here at 10, leave at 7. Whatever it is, it's got to be consistent. Packard came up with it. Attaching on to safety needs, there's the need for emotional security. We are in a search for products that makes us feel safe and secure in uncertain times. Traditionally, like, why else would I buy life insurance? That's probably not something that you automatically think about going to purchase, like right now. Yeah, man, let me get some more life insurance. But do you need it? You want this, and how, how is it sold to you? It's sold. You want to protect your family, don't you? You need life insurance. Michelin tires. Uh, for the longest time, this was their tag uh, line from the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, so much is riding on your tires, and they would have a little baby there. I mean, you don't you want to buy the safest tire, the best tire out there? Or you're not going to go around cheap, are you? Interesting. The need and the need for emotional security in the COVID-19 pandemic. Some items have been outselling everything. And uh, toilet paper, as well as paper towels, just are hit off the market in the first months of the COVID-19 outbreak. And even uh, as we speak, going into you know 2021, they're not the easiest things to buy. Again, it was, you know, why? Why, why, why? Why were people hoarding that? It, in a very scary unpredictable time, I can do this. I can buy these items and I can look at them and I feel safer about it. It is a perception. Very interesting. The need for emotional security, safety needs. Do we stop there? No, we're social people, okay? It's deep in our DNA uh, to have a sense of belonging. We like to give and receive appreciation at work, at school, wherever we are, the family. Again, we have those social needs. So Packard came up with the need for roots. Okay, kind of come back to the social need from Maslow. We search for products that remind us of home, family, wherever we are in life. Why do restaurants, for the most part, whether I'm at a Starbucks in Texas or if I'm traveling to North Carolina or I'm in a Chipotle or whatever it is, we kind of have the same layouts, pretty much exactly the same. Like maybe a little bit different, but the menu's the same. Uh, we know standardization is, is what we are, do look for. Hey, I can get my white chocolate mocha decaf, not decaf, uh, with uh, soy, excuse me, and uh, no whip. I can get it here in Texas. I can get it in North Carolina. I can get it in Canada. I can get it wherever I'm going. It makes me feel, reminds me of home. The best part of waking up from Folgers no matter where you are, as Felger's in your cup. That reasoning behind that ad campaign was wherever you are, the young person coming home from college or coming home from work or coming home from service somewhere, you know what, it always reminds me of home. Brand loyalty is so important and consistency among it. The need for love objects, also social needs. When mom and dad become in the empty nest, and the children are no longer, they're already, you know, they're off to their own careers and their own lives. Uh, we see people volunteering. I, I have to give. I have pets. I have new hobbies. I want to belong to new groups. It's always that tr tremendous social needs. I want to be a part of something. Esteem. Oh, we're really going up this pyramid now. If, you know, we could probably solve all the world's problems if everyone had enough self-esteem, isn't it? It's the need for self-worth, for integrity. The work must be important in esteem. I want to accomplish something larger than myself. 
all right l'oreal's tagline because you're worth it i am worth it i need this i need that set of ping golf clubs with the bag all the woods uh, no matter the cost because i'm worth it and i would play my best with those Packer Pink, you know, uh, counterpart is the need for reassurance, the worth, and ego, and ego gratification. We search for products, my friends, that make us feel very good about ourselves. That Armani suit right there, that's something that you can only pick up in some very high-end stores, correct? Those are $2,000 minimum buy-in, not including the shoes. I've got that promotion. I'm worth it. You know, when we look at esteem, there's high self-esteem. High self-esteem means you're pretty much in contentment. I don't really care what people think. I don't need to impress anyone. Now, this is on Northeast Campus. I took a picture. Not quite my Corolla. Not too far from it either, but I don't have any more. That car was in a wreck and saved my life, but there it is. This car, uh, again, I think it's amazing. This car is parked usually at the front of the parking lot. Um, it's beat up. Uh, you know, the windows uh, are, there's no air conditioning, you know, there's bungee cords on the back of it. And I just think that whoever drives this car has the highest self-esteem that I could ever, I'd ever know of. Because they're, they are not trying to impress anybody. They're just looking for functionality, getting to their office as fast, you know, the quickest route. And, they, and they're strong with themselves. And I have complete admiration to that. Okay. The lower the self-esteem one has. Okay, uh, we need more things, all right, to make us feel better. And so, as you see people in different uh, areas of power at work, again, you may see that maybe they're just really suffering from a lot of low self esteem, which is why they have to put everything on everybody else and be so mean all the time. Now, hey, all right, wait a second. Okay, yeah, those I, I own those reels, those fishing reels. I like to buy <clears throat> expensive uh, fishing equipment, but I needed it. Okay, I really did. That is the Shimano Conquest Calcutta. Both reels, one's in gold, one's in uh, machined silver, uh, uh, aluminum color. And uh, they, uh, they make me feel, I mean, they help me fish better. <laughs> yeah, they make me feel good too. And, and they're expensive. They're terribly expensive. Uh, we're not talking two, three hundred dollars either. We're, we're, we're talking more than that. But you know what? Maybe it's an obsession, but I'm okay with that. And as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, I think it's fine. Are things that we buy that we love uh, and the purchase behind it, the motivation is always so strong. Look at that. Look at that. Does that say wimpy or does that say big and bad right there? Yeah, absolutely. The need for power and strength. This is an esteem. This is what Packard came up with. You want to increase your power. You want products that make, we want products, make so big and bad, the extra heavy duty. Are you going to go buy trash bags that say uh, probably will break and they're pretty crappy? No, no, Glad came out with extra heavy duty. So everybody has to come out with extra heavy duty bags and uh, everything just so it makes us feel so strong and so powerful. Now that's a beautiful truck. Hey, are you a farmer or a rancher that's pulling equipment? No, no. Are you pulling a, you know, a 50-foot boat? Nope. I'm just driving to class and back. Uh, but I need this because it makes me assert my power. Those big trucks are big sellers, my friends. Self-actualization. As we go down, as we go up Maslow, the very top, this is the Nirvana become everything that I can be. I'm an expert in my field. You don't necessarily have to make the most money. That, that's not what this is about. Uh, it's that I am in a different psychological standpoint of my motivation. I want to help somebody. I want to be a mentor to you. These are different ways to express self-actualization. Some of the stuff closely aligned with Packard's compelling needs or the hidden motivators are the need for creative outlets. I want to create something by hand, okay? So maybe it's art. You know, I want to I want to buy a, I want to be an artist, or I want to purchase something art because it just looks so beautiful. That's who I am. It's my decor: gardening, cooking. This is Eatsies. I don't know if you're familiar with Eatsies. There's one in Fort Worth off University Boulevard. There's one in Grapevine 
of William D. Tay. Eatsies was the brainchild of Norman Brinker. Norman Brinker in the 70s and 80s was just an amazing restaurateur. Uh, he's behind Chili's, he's behind Macaroni Grill, and he's behind so many different restaurants. And this was what he thought was going to be the next big trend, was almost homemade. It took, it, 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 it took a long time to pick up steam, but he pulled this off in about the middle 90s. And that is, people still want to say, I cooked it, I created it, and families. And so, I'm coming home from a hard day's work, I don't have time. How many of us have time to make dinner every single night? Well, we, we may now, during the situation we're in. But, you know, on what life used to be and, and, and will be again in the next coming years, where we're out working or back in, uh, I, I still want to act like I made feel. So this is what Norman Brinker came up with. This was all basically pre-cooked or, or everything was done. You had to do just a few different things to it. It's really not a restaurant. It's a high-end, uh, almost prepared grocery where you would take in your salmon croquet, you got your broccoli there, you've got a beautiful pasta salad, you've got fruit, you've got a lot of entrees. These, at the time, were all real chefs. Uh, and that's what kind of made the business model difficult because they were <laughs> paid a lot of money. And so they have one or two chefs with a lot of sous chefs underneath them now. So they'll tell you how to make it. Here's what you have to do. Heat it, put it in the oven, 350 for 25 minutes, uh, put this on. So you still made it and now you're serving it to your family and it's the amazing quality. So that's Eatsies in a nutshell for you. If you ever have time uh, to, to go buy one, one in Great Buy, one off University, it's pretty cool stuff self-actualization. We want to find the products that we believe will make us or our families better, don't we? Why do we buy organic? You know, because I, I, I want that for, for myself, for my family, for my friends. Uh, Self-improvement books, things that we want to be better at. What's another need on self-actualization? Pulling off Maslow? The highest is that need for immortality. Do we really want to get old, or is that a fear? For most people, it is a fear. We, we, you know, we want to still feel like I'm 27 again, don't we? We want to have that, 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 that energy, uh, that muscle mass, that everything. The cosmetic market in the United States, just the women's cosmetic market, is a trillion-dollar market. Trillion. Uh, men's market is uh, maybe five, six billion dollars uh, of, of beauty aid, so to speak, uh, and grooming. That is huge, my friends. Oh, that's what this business is all about. Inter, inner beauty. That was from Devil Wears Prada. Uh, huge amounts of money here. Why, why, again, buying that Porsche makes me feel younger. I may... I may have some increased risk behavior. I may have some careless attitudes of how I do things as I get older and want to want to feel that young again. We, anything that reminds us of youth, we work out, we want better nutrition, anti-aging, some good stuff there. Then it does get into some, some different psychological. I've got to have this. I will be younger again. That's what we feel like. Interesting ways right in there, my friends. I hope you enjoyed that little trip from Maslow. And then again with Vance Packard, if you can lock in on the products that you're dealing with now, the businesses that you have, um, lock in some of those hidden persuaders. Make sure that your customer is feeling that, that they are getting that strength, they're getting that you know, immortality, they're getting that safety, they're getting that social belonging. Um, and see if that doesn't increase sales right there. The psychological factors again, the perception, the learning, the beliefs, the attitudes that we hold towards things. Yes, absolutely. There are what? There are a lot of factors that go into our purchases, my friends. I don't ever want to trivialize that. The customer that you have, the customer that you're targeting, okay, what if you work a nonprofit and you need more donors? Uh, we, that's, that's your job in the nonprofit world is to basically get out there and beg for money as hard as you possibly can. How do I get them to support my cause? A lot of factors goes into those purchases, my friends. So let's look at the buying decision process. For whatever we purchase from a stick of gum 
all the way to the Tesla S, we have a decision-making process. Again, our brains are so efficient, this can happen in a millisecond. It may take a little longer, and generally speaking, always generally speaking here, for the larger purchase price, like a very expensive car, a home, something of that nature, the longer this process is going to be. We have need recognition, we, we search, we evaluate our alternatives, we decide to purchase, and then something happens after that too. We sometimes take for granted. We have a feeling after we purchase. So the need recognition. Okay, remember, need internal stimulus. There's pain involved. How much have we talked about pain, my friends? You solve someone else's problems for them. You help them through the process of the pain. And you, you uh, can make a very good business around that. So the pain could be hunger, thirst, cold, desire. All right. There's stimulus. There's advertising, the sales promotion. I need the outfit. I must have that car. I need to buy a car. All right, so now I start looking. That's the very first thing. What am I going to do? Then I start looking at information. Now, this depends on the product you, you buy. The low-cost item, you may not have to have any information because you bought it before. It's a repeat purchase. Okay, your brain has already gone through all the processes, all right, all the synapse, all the dendrites, all everything is in place. You know exactly on a day, I'm going to go hit Chipotle, and I know exactly what I'm going to buy. Okay, I'm going to get that chicken quesadilla. Big ticket item, much more. How do we start our information searches? Well, Google calls it Zimat. That is the zero moment of truth. That's when the buying process begins. How many times something new, especially, uh, I'm going to hit a Google search real quick. Just look at it. Uh, yeah, that's where Google locks you in, and of course, that's where all their ad services come in right after that, uh, or right during that, I should say, as well, is, is, is whatever you searched, who paid the right price to get their information to you the, at first. There is a pecking order. Those Google searches, they are very, they are not unbiased. They are extraordinarily biased by whatever words you put in, because a, a company knows if I can be the first one that you see, you know, I've got a much better chance of you purchasing from me. So, those are some of the things we do. Maybe we experience it, all right? Maybe if you're on the car a lot and somebody says, oh, you know what, just check your credit, everything is good, why don't you take the car home for the weekend? If you'll just bring that puppy home too, you know, 90% of the time, you're going to keep the puppy. 90% of the time, if you're able to take the car home for the weekend or the SUV or whatever, you're, you're going to come back on Monday uh, uh, with the order all complete, you are buying that. So, yes, we have the need, we information search it, and we, we evaluate, okay? That is, you know, again, we narrow down by the brand, and, which is very important. If you've always wanted a Nikon camera, that's what you've wanted. Uh, you know, when another good camera comes up like Canon, you said, no, I really want the Nikon. You know, again, you're probably going to go on, on the brand. So we look at the brands. If you're doesn't matter to you, and then you do a lot of different research, look at the price, the style, the service, and of course we make the deal. We want this in the marketing world to be painless as possible. Back in the day, my friend, back in the day, back in the day, you had to actually go out and, and drive to a store. Okay, what happens along the way? I'm driving to the mall to buy that camera, I may see something else, because I think that's where the camera stores used to be, and they were. Uh, I might, oh, i got to stop off for gas. Oh, I, I'm hungry. I go to lunch. I may forget all about going to the place I wanted to go. Today, it, to make it painless, buy it now. That one-click buy on Amazon, the eBay quick checkout, as fast as you can do it on your phone. Marketing world never thought that would ever be possible 30 years ago. It's the norm today makes it so much easier. Does anyone else have a problem besides me? And my problem is not with this. My problem is this. I just buy too much. The quick eBay hit. And it's a little bit of a hit right there. You know what I mean? Uh, the quick Amazon. And, of course, feeding everything to you that you've ever seen, what you might like. Pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. It's not just cookies. Those are hardcore algorithms drilling us 
every single day because we've been online and we've, we've we initiated that zero moment of truth and now we cannot break free from it. I bought it. Is there an emotion when we buy something? It better be. I mean, that's what we, that's what we do. Again, at least in the United States, we do that. Yeah, oh, she just got that exact thing she wanted. We, just, we do a jump. We get a little bit high, don't we? A little bit of that, ah, oh, it feels great. I got that, and of course, how fast do I get the product? Now comes in the post-purchase. All right, I feel good, I feel good. Do you ever not feel good? Okay, yeah, we do. We have to avoid this. It's that cognitive dissonance. That's a nice $4 word, isn't it? That's from psychology. We never want to be in this state. We really don't. We want to be in homostasis or buyer's remorse. Uh, why did I buy that car? <laughs> why am I driving home with something new that uh, I know I really can't afford? To, uh, why did I buy this purchase? Anyone do that lately? Especially on something big you bought? More than likely, you've, you've had this feeling. If you haven't bought anything yet big enough but it had to be giantly expensive it can just be something i don't know why I, I just did that extra purchase today this morning on my ebay i didn't need that and i just got to you know why did i do that companies spend millions millions and millions of dollars trying to make sure you feel good so if you are in sales how many times have you had a thank you letter certainly on the bigger prod um, products that you buy purchases if you bought a car in the last year did the dealer did they immediately give you a handwritten thank you letter hey we can always send out the the text and the email thanks so much and and, that, and that's important no doubt and the phone calls are important but those when you have a chance to write those thank you letters that means a lot to people that you're really really trying to ease them through you are so smart you just bought the best car out there you bought the best piece of equipment you could. I'm sure glad you love that MacBook Pro. Now, some products are so amazing that, that you, you don't have that uh, problem, but we need to remember this. We talked about that in the first unit, the customer loyalty. It is so strong. We have to please the customer, but it's got to be our customer, okay? Not just anybody. It's got to be our target market customer. Again, Sewell, automobiles, Lexus, Cadillac, uh, BMW, $600,000 is what you are. So when you see that customer coming in, 16000 at Starbucks. So it's not just a one-time purchase. Making our true customers happy, our loyal friends happy, is how you build your business. Now, how fast, you're asking, will someone buy into a new product or service? Interesting. It's called the adoption process, and it's a new product adoption. Uh, when do you buy? What area? There's got to be some awareness. There's got to be interest. We've got to evaluate trial, adoption. How fast are you likely to buy something that you have not bought before? Not just a, not talking about going out to lunch every day or, or purchasing a product you, you, you've done before. Something brand new. Um, again, as we look in the world of products and consumer marketing, um, our new products are how we live. We, we have to have new and exciting things coming out. we pretty interesting to know how fast will our target market buy. So we have to look at the market in general. So the, the, uh, uh, the process goes to the awareness. How, how quickly am I aware of the new product? Okay, uh, I need information. And so... I've got to have the awareness. Also, I have to have an interest in it. All right, I, I seek information about that new product. How fast can we get it to our target market? Okay, uh, then okay. So now I'm aware of it. All right. Let's just say when Netflix came out. Netflix is a very very interesting story. It has a lot to do with Blockbuster, which was a Dallas-based company um, from the 1990s. So when Netflix was coming out, a lot of people were again we're just looking at. Uh, remember, the smart TV didn't, did not come out until the year 2007, and Netflix was around since two, the, the late 90s. You, if you're in the late 90s, you may never even knew what Netflix was. And then Netflix came out with the DVD system, where basically no late fees. And then they started coming out with, hey, we can stream this. 
So what did they do to get people interested? Okay, now you know a little about Netflix. We get to the movies you want. How about one month free? All you got to do is hit this right here. One month is completely free. And then you can just sign off afterward. Uh, they were one of the first subscription models online. One of the first. And it worked tremendously for them. So, yeah, we want to see if it makes sense. We evaluate. We try it on a small scale. Then we decide to say, hey, you know what? Do I want this or not? So those are kind of the steps into the new product adoption process. It worked great for Netflix. They were kind of one of the first to get out there with the streaming, and and the rest is history. They're almost they're over a hundred million subscriptions. A third of the United States is on Netflix. Now, who buys when? Who are the first people out there? Okay, so adoption category we want to based on the relative time of adoption. So we have people who will buy it. Just like that, these are what we call innovators. Think of a product that comes about, or maybe it's in a in, in the product category, like let's say electronics, and you want to buy it. Let's go back to flat screen TVs. Now, flat screen TVs did not come out till two, the year two thousand, uh, maybe ninety nine to about ninety nine to two thousand two. They were very new. They were extraordinarily expensive. Your thirty two inch flat screen TV could have been five grand. Okay. Uh, by the time you, in, you know, it, it, it certainly went into a lot of production issues and got faster and better. But these were plasma TVs and maybe a 40 inch. <laughs> Again, they were extraordinarily expensive. The innovators are the first to buy. They're very venturesome. Maybe it's the ego driving it. They want to be the first. They love the stuff, but they're small. Only two and a half percent of a market that you're trying to penetrate, get into, will buy, be the first ones. But they're going to tell a lot of people. So they, they why they are very small, they are very important. Because this is this this is going to be the influencer. Right after the innovator is the early adopter. The early adopter, it's almost 14% of the market you're going after. The early adopter looks at the innovator and says, hey, what did you think? Okay. They're going to adopt early, very early. But they want to just see somebody else get it first. Have we ever done that? Who's going to sit down first? Who's going to speak first? Who's going to do this first? Then we'll follow that lead. So there's the innovators. There's the early adopters. And then there's the deliberate. This is like the mainstream of the market right in here, which you've got to ride about 35, 34%. I want to get this. I really wanted that flat screen TV. I'm not sure I'm going to pay $5,000. So these people right in here were purchasing right in 2000, the year 2000. To 2002, 3, 4, and then they probably bought right about 2004, 2005. All of a sudden, the TVs are coming down. Now they're in the low thousands, right in here, maybe $1,500. Okay, ask somebody who bought a TV back in that time, what did they pay their first flat screen? They're getting, of course, the, TV, the, the product's getting better. It, it's maybe gone through an iteration of production, so it, it's prices are coming down. And so there we go. Late mainstream, this this may be a year later, okay? This is happening fast within probably, again, it just depends on how advanced the technology is. Uh, again, think about fashion. Think about fall clothing. Think about spring clothing. Um, the first to buy your the fall wardrobe, fall came out literally on a, on a given year that doesn't have what we're going through in it. Fall... Uh, line is probably introduced in May. So those who are purchasing in May, when you're saying May, man, it's just in Texas, we're still getting into, we're, we're, we're starting the 100 degree weather. They're going to buy it very early in the season, probably paying the highest cost for it uh, because the price for it, because they want to, they want to be the first to say, hey, this is the new fashion and I'm wearing it. And then again, we'll drop off and we'll buy maybe in September, maybe we're October. And of course, late mainstream is going to be much later than that. So again, it just depends on that product, how fast this is going. This flat screen TV did take a while, but uh, all the regular older TVs just got completely phased out. And so then you come into late and lagging adopters. The lagging adopter is, you know what? I can't buy. There's no... There's nothing that I can't buy. When my mother finally purchased a flat screen TV, she wanted to go back to the old Sony Trinitron. If anyone's old enough to understand what that is, it's the big old tube TV, which took up half the living room, uh, because that's what they were. That's 
That's what they had always used, but she couldn't. She had to buy the flat screen TV. By that time, it's gone through. We're talking 2010, 2011. There's nothing else you can buy, and she bought it at the cheapest price. Um, that's the lagging adopter. Just an interesting note, it takes about 20% of your projected market for a product to become a to get the critical mass it needs to be successful. Whatever market share you thought you were going to get out of a market, okay, you got to get 20% of that uh, because it's going to go right about in here. Uh, you know, if we were graphing it out, to think that I got critical mass, I can continue with my product. Most new products just can't get out of here. It's very interesting. We're going to look at that in uh, a little bit later, but how the new product success rate is very, very, very poor. Product that makes it, you've done a great job on that. So this is the adoption category. The first are the innovators, early adoption, mainstream, late mainstream, and that's just nothing left. I have to buy that product. So where are you? Very interesting. Where can we find these people and these right in here? Because these have what? they have tremendous influence over this group right in here. Here we got 70% of the market. They want to see it, so they're going to rely heavily on these two right here to tell them this is a great deal. If they say it's a terrible product, you don't want it, they're gone. Never buy it. Well, how fast will I adopt? Again, it's got to have advantage, it's got to have compatibility, it's got to have complexity. What about the cost? What about the, how, how did you communicate this? The advantage. All right, it's got to be better. There's so much, my friends, about being first in the market. It's got to be compatible, too. What blew up Apple was the iPod. The iPod finally brought PC user and Mac user together because you could use it on either system. And of course, then they had iTunes. It's a great story to read, uh, to really read the backstory on of how it, it just seemed to. They caught lightning in the bottle, uh, and the iPod was great. Well, Microsoft allows them to get, I don't know, a decade into this, it, would it seem, because the iPods came out in the very late 90s. And then they came out with a Zoom player. I don't know if anyone ever saw a Zoom player. Nothing particularly cool about it. It was a behemoth of a product, and when I say that is, I mean, it was big. Uh, the uh, iPods were getting smaller and smaller until you could almost put one into a shirt pocket uh, before, again, the 2007 iPhones came out. So you had a good seven, eight years of, of, of you know, Apple dominating and, of course, iTunes dominating. So here comes the Zoom. Okay, it's different. Microsoft says it's better. They put a ton of money into this. They put somewhere between 60 to $70 million into the Zoom. And here's what it could not do. It could not work with iTunes. So it was not compatible with anything. The only thing it was compatible with was the Microsoft Store. And uh, when's the last time you bought something off that? Maybe a game. Uh, and maybe, now I think the MS uh, Microsoft Surface, I have one here from work. It's, it, I like it. It's very, very good. But it took a long time to get that thing out. So, yeah, and that's, Zoom could never take off because you just didn't know where to download any music unless you had it from your own, you know, your own computer. So that was a big bust right there. How fast is it the complexity of a product uh, when the apple watches first came out and again it's iteration one so you had to have the innovators in there uh now a lot of people bought it a lot of people didn't because okay why is this any better really can't use it it's difficult to understand we got to make it very easy uh and again why was it, how much is it why are these things three four hundred dollars when all it does is tell time until yeah, the right group came along, and again, the battery life was very short at first, but Apple never gave up. They knew they had what they needed, and again, um, the production process got so much better with it. And again, you've got to be able to communicate why this is great. Oh, well, you see your whole phone right in here uh, on, on it. It's a wearable. Uh, right now, the smartwatches are 44% of the total watch market, so basically they're half right now and, and gaining uh, power every day. So, again, how fast? Why? It's their lower prices a little bit. Uh, they're not as complex. Uh, uh, and, again, the, the, they're communicating what I can do with it. If it's just sitting out there and you don't know what to do, when you confuse your customer, they're just going to go somewhere else. They're going to do something different. Why? We don't want to be confused. 
Business to business, my friends, if you are in a career or can get into a career, that's the business to business market, do it. Uh, it is more stressful, but that's where very large incomes can be made. Again, certainly in B2B sales. Now, I know a lot of people don't think, oh, I don't want to go to college and be a salesperson, but uh, I think that's a kind of wrong thinking. Uh, don't let that opportunity pass you by, especially if, if you're good at it, because that's probably the fastest route to a six-figure income. So when you, the buying, decision-making in corporations, so you're selling to larger businesses, okay? And so, uh, again, these are big, big ticket items. The process is more complicated because you have a lot of moving parts. You have a lot of different people. You need a capital budget years, finding, evaluating, choosing the brands, uh, alternative suppliers. So there is big things. One of the biggest uh, times of the year is coming right upon us, and that would be October 1st. And the reason October 1st so many organizations put their fiscal year on this date is because that's a government state. So the United States government starts their new, their 2021 year, fiscal, financial year, on October 1st. So all of a sudden their budgets are brand new. So many organizations follow that. So this is a big time right now in the B2B market. Because once someone has their capital budget and it's flush with money, then you can say, hey, I, I think I need this giant piece of equipment. We can now afford it. So more complex decisions, very large sums of money. I mean, we're in the millions on some of these uh, items are certainly tens and ten, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, a longer process, a lot of interactions, but it's also a pretty fast route. I didn't say it was stress-free. No, I did not. It's a lot of stress, but hey, life stressful, so big deal. Uh, you know, you can do very, very well. That's why I kind of just drop the B2B market in this class because I don't want you to forget about it. And if the opportunity arises in your ability and career move to, to, to work in this area, it could be uh, quite successful for you. Most of the online market and, and online commerce, now that is changing as we speak, but most of it was not in the retail area. Uh, much more now since of the you know area we're in in the pandemic of COVID-19. But uh, it was always in the B2B, you know, so again, what I'm saying here is 80% was online commerce, which means we're, 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 we're linking to our suppliers, company buying sites, online bid proposals. Your computer skills need to be top notch right now. And, and those who are, are probably be able to work at home right now. So my friends, anytime you can upgrade your computer skills, uh, do so. It can, it's really going to help propel your career. I hope from this first unit. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a better understanding of the consumer market and the major factors that influence buying behavior. There are courses just in buying behavior. At, at, if you go on for a marketing degree uh, from undergraduate to graduate, an entire course. There is now a degree at UNT. I think I briefly spoke about it in the first unit. But again, it is the consumer experience degree. Uh, and the vice president or the director of the consumer experience is so important. I think you see why I can't have you buy my product one time. I need you to be a follower, a believer in my product that you're always going to buy it. So I think we know the stages maybe a little better, the decision making process and the adoption rate for new products. So there we are with our first lecture series down. Friends, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. hope you're able to enjoy something. We're coming into the fall uh, uh, time and the weather's getting cooler. So get outside, do something fun. Get ready for our next lecture, The Target Market.